What a blessing it is to, uh, to see all of you and to be here. What a blessing it is to be the body of Christ, His hands and feet and eyes and ears, so that we can work together in unison as we worship God and as we study His Word and as we love one another and as we reach the lost. I hope all of us are making an effort to, uh, to grow and to push ourselves spiritually. I want to talk this morning, the title of my lesson is Enjoy Life. We've been studying in Ecclesiastes, and we just started Song of Solomon this, this morning in the, in the adult Bible class, but uh, I wanted to do a lesson from Ecclesiastes, even though we've already moved past that book. Sometimes people perceive Christianity as really just a killjoy. In their minds, to be a Christian means to have no fun, to remove all pleasures, and to just be miserable. They think that happiness for Christians only belongs in the afterlife. Some Christians have this mentality. But that's not true. In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes uh, repeatedly commends pleasure and encourages us to enjoy life. For example... In Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verses 24 and 25. And if you're not in Ecclesiastes, I do ask you to invite you to turn your Bibles there. In Ecclesiastes 2, 24 and 25, there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen, that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? What a what a wonderful, encouraging verse. There are lots of verses like this in the book. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes is written from the perspective of life under the sun. So when we just look at this earthly existence, we see that death comes to everybody. We see that no matter how you live, that everybody's going to experience good times and, and bad times. And we see that no lasting fulfillment can be found here on this earth. And so one of the pieces of advice that God through Solomon uh, gives us is embrace the <coughs> pleasures that this life affords us in our effort living uh, this life under the sun. Of course, we need to view that with, uh, with balance. So we're going to see that, yes, we need to embrace uh, joy and we need to embrace the pleasures of this life, but we will also see that as valuable as pleasure is, it's not ultimately what matters. And so first, let's talk about the fact that enjoyment is from God. It's from God. It is a gift. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, read with me verses 12 and 13. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor it is the gift of God. In James chapter 1, James tells us that everything, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of lights. And so, pleasure, enjoyment, that is a gift. It is a perfect gift from God. Have you ever tried to give somebody a gift and they wouldn't take it? They didn't feel worthy and they felt bad for you to be so generous I used to be that guy. It was, and it's still hard for me to allow people to do simple things sometimes. But you know what? When you refuse to accept a gift from somebody, you are robbing them of a blessing that they have in giving the gift. So here's God trying to give us a gift of pleasure. Do you say to that, no, I'm not worthy. I, I can't do that. I feel guilty to, to enjoy anything. Well then really we're robbing ourselves of something that we ought to be able to enjoy and robbing God of, of the joy of giving us something He wants us to have. We learn from Ecclesiastes that, uh, that this idea of pleasure is a reward of our labor. Look in chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes in verses 18 through 20. Ecclesiastes 5, beginning in verse 18. He says, Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting. To eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself in all one's labor, in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his, uh, of his life, which God has given him. For this is his reward. 
Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, He has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. I love the end of that, that that last verse there. It's the idea that God's going to keep you so busy with the things that we can enjoy, that we're going to forget about all the bad stuff. Ingrid Bergman said, happiness is good health and a bad memory. And I think, I think there's some truth to that idea that, that happiness, part, part of that is a, a bad memory about the bad things. Why do we labor so hard in this life? We labor in our jobs. We come home from our jobs and we labor to keep the house up and to feed everybody and to make sure everybody's taken care of. It's a lot of of labor. Why do we do that? Well, part of the reason is so that we can rejoice in the reward of our labor, so that we can enjoy that. It's so fulfilling to work so hard and to kind of earn the right to be able to relax or maybe to earn the money, to be able to go and do something relaxing and enjoyable. So what is that reward specifically? Well, the passage we just looked at, several of them actually, mention food and drink. Can you imagine this life without the blessing of being able to enjoy a wonderful meal? What if you lost... (laughs) Brian's going, no. (laughs) We know that, Brian. We know how much you love food. Um, can you imagine if you lost all of your taste buds? You know, sometimes uh, when people go through radiation treatments, they will lose the ability to taste food very much. One man told me that everything tastes like metal. And I just, I just thought, that must be horrible. That's one of the most basic pleasures. That's why Solomon mentions it over and over. Of, of this life under the sun is being able to enjoy a delicious a delicious meal. Well, let's look at another passage that mentions that same blessing, but some others as well. Go to Ecclesiastes 9, please. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and let's read verses 7 through 9. Go then, eat your bread in happiness, and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. Now, let's pause here. I want to clarify a couple things. Now, first of all, I love how he says God has already approved your works. In other words, you don't have to feel feel guilty about letting yourself enjoy some things here in this life. Now, when he says wine, he's not encouraging drunkenness. In this very book, Solomon earlier, he condemns drunkenness as folly. What he's talking about is drinking something that tastes good. Wine in the Bible days, you know, we think of wine today like it was the same thing back then. Well, no, we can't compare them that that way. In Bible days, uh, wine was not always fermented. It could be juice and still be called wine. And even when it was fermented, it was most often heavily diluted with water so that you really would have to drink an awful lot to, to get drunk. But the point here is not drunkenness or getting tipsy. The point here is drinking something that tastes good. He's not saying enjoy food and water. Well, that doesn't sound very fun, does it? For me, the drink would be cream soda. So those of you who know me know that's kind of my vacation drink. Now to the next verse. In in verse 8, Let your clothes be white all the time, and let not oil be lacking on your head. In ancient times, you would normally have one or maybe two outfits. We have oodles of clothes today. They didn't have that many clothes back then, generally speaking. And uh, you would maybe have a set of white clothes, which weren't your daily clothes. That was for special occasions only. And oil being expensive would be something that you wouldn't put on your head every day, but something only reserved for very special, rare occasions. What Solomon is saying here is let every day be a special occasion. Sometimes we just get caught in this drudgery of life where it's just like, I'm just trying to make it through the day. I'm just trying to survive. I understand that. But we are given permission by God to make every day special. And look at the next verse in verse 9. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life which He has given you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. 
Why did you marry the person you're married to if you're married? Probably because you enjoyed being with them so much you wanted to be with them for the rest of your life. They were your best friend. And I don't know what happens when we get married, but sadly, sometimes we're not best friends anymore. Sometimes you become each other's worst critic. Sometimes you become enemies and you're against each other. But you should still be friends. We should be best friends. You should enjoy this life together. That's why God gave us the blessing of marriage. It's supposed to be something that is enjoyed. And of course, the intimate side of marriage, which Brian talked about in the Song of Solomon, is something that ought to be embraced and enjoyed as well. But too often, marriage just kind of becomes a drudgery. You know, she's, she's a ball and chain, some men think, and women think the same about him. It ought not be that way. We ought to be able to enjoy that. And if our marriages are not enjoyable, we need to fix them. We need to fix them. What other kind of uh, blessings does he talk about that we can enjoy in this life under the sun? Well, another one is rest. Look in chapter 5 and verse 12. Chapter 5 and verse 12, Solomon says, The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. You know, the laboring man may not make much money, but when he gets home from work and has a good meal and spends some time with his family and then lays his head down, he can sleep like a baby. That is a blessing. That is a real blessing. Maybe some of us like sleep a little too much, but it is a real blessing. Well, we could add family outings, uh, taking a walk on a beautiful day, enjoying wholesome entertainment, doing your favorite hobby. I love martial arts. I love to get out there with, you know, what, my, my bow staff. And that's just to me, I'm in a different world. It's my escape. Do you have some escape? It's good to have an escape. It's good to have a hobby that you enjoy doing. Traveling. Some of us love traveling. Game nights with brethren. You know, so often it's just the simple things that bring us so much pleasure. Charles Spurgeon said, It is not how much we have, but how much we enjoy that makes happiness. And that really is the case. And, and that requires perhaps a shift in mentality. We need to learn to scan the world for the positive. I really love the book called The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor. There are some, some things I don't like about it when he talks about evolution and things like that. But he, one of the things that stuck out to me the most in that, that book is he talks about scanning the world for the positive. Scanning the world for the positive. And he talks about this very famous psychology experiment where subjects are asked to watch this video. And in the video, there are two basketball teams, one dressed in white jerseys, the other dressed in black jerseys. And one of the teams is passing the basketball to the various team members. And the subjects are asked to count the number of times the ball bounces or the number of times it's passed, something like that. I can't remember which one. But they're supposed to focus on that ball. And during the course of this video, after about 20-something seconds, a man dressed in a gorilla suit walks across the screen in plain view. It's a very famous experiment. You may have heard of that. Most of the people who were watching that ball did not see the man in the gorilla suit at all. And when they were asked to watch the video a second time and told not to focus on that basketball, but to look for the man in the gorilla suit, of course they all saw what was exceedingly obvious. Why? Why did they not notice the man the first time? Because that's not what they were looking for. We see what we're looking to see, and we miss everything else. If we're looking for the negative, if we're looking for things to complain about, if we're looking for things to be unhappy about in this vain life under the sun, trust me, we're going to find it, an awful lot of it, and we're going to miss all the good stuff. But if we have trained our minds and if we are looking for, scanning our world for the blessings that God has given us, we'll see those and we won't see the bad stuff. At least it won't be as obvious to us. And that's what I think partly Solomon is saying. 
Well, while it's true that enjoyment is a gift from God, it's also a fact that this life is short. Therefore, we need to enjoy life right now. Now, I'm going to go through these next two major points quicker than I did the first uh, point that we just finished up. Now, for some people, happiness always seems to be in the future. Uh, it's kind of like that bully on the playground that's kind of the cowardly bully, and he draws a line in the sand and dares the, the boy across there to step across the line. So the boy steps across the line, and the bully backs up and draws another line, says, we'll step across that one. When he steps across that one, he backs up again. That's, for some people, how happiness is in this, in this life under the sun. We're looking for ultimate fulfillment. We're not finding it anywhere. And so what happens is we think, well, it's going to be just past that line. And then when we get across that line, we go, well, no, that's not it. It's going to be across the next one. And it keeps backing up and backing up, and we never actually find it. They think they'll be happy once they graduate high school. Then they think they'll be happy once they graduate college. Then they think they'll be happy once they get married. Well, maybe I'll be happy when I have kids. Well, wait, maybe I'll find happiness once I, once I become financially successful. Well, maybe I'll be happy once my kids are grown and out of the house. Maybe I'll be happy once I retire. And before they know it, their life is, is used up. Their life is gone. As a result, they're failing to enjoy the small things in the moment. And so Solomon tells us in chapter 11 and verses 7 and 8, to rejoice in all your years. Let's look at that passage, Ecclesiastes 11 and verses 7 and 8. He says, the light is pleasant and it is good for the eyes to see the sun. Now let's pause there. It's a simple verse. Some versions say, the light is sweet. He's saying, get outside. Enjoy the sunshine. Enjoy the outdoors. Breathe in some fresh air. Now look at what he says next. Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all. Now we're going to pause there. We're going to come back and look at the second half of this verse a little later. But we're going to pause right there uh, for now. So rejoice in all of your years. We often tend to think that happiness belongs to people who are a different age than we are. No matter what age we are. It must belong to somebody at a different age. Young people think they're going to be happy when they grow up. That's why they state their age the way that they do. I'm seven and a half. Or seven and three quarters. They just can't wait till they get eight. They want to grow up so quickly. But you notice older people don't do that. You don't ever hear somebody say, I'm 77 and a half. <laughs> That's because... The older people want to be younger, and the younger people want to be older. But Solomon is saying, rejoice in all of your years, in every season of life. Now I want to go to chapter 7 and look in verse 14. Chapter 7 and in verse 14. Another point. He says, in the day of prosperity be happy, but in the day of adversity consider God has made the one as well as the other so that man will not discover anything that will come after him. So we need to enjoy the good times while they last. You know, we cannot control prosperity or adversity, but we can and must control our response to both of those. During the hard times, we need to stop and consider how we can grow stronger as a re result of the adversity that we're going through. During the good times, we need to be thankful. We need to enjoy the moment. We need to enjoy those times of, of good health and vitality, of family wellness and unity, of career stability and satisfaction. Sometimes we're going through those times and we don't, we don't see them for the blessing that they are because we're not scanning the world for the positive. It will really help us to appreciate those blessings more when we realize how temporary they are. 
We're not guaranteed those our entire existence here on this earth. In fact, we need to realize bad times are ahead. Look in Ecclesiastes 11, going back to that verse, verse 8, the second half of the verse. And let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything that is to come will be futility. I realize that's not the most encouraging thought. You probably don't want your preacher standing up here and saying, hey, good times may be going on right now, but life is going to get horrible, folks. It's going to get awful. The times ahead are going to be dark. That sounds very depressing. But Solomon is realistic. That's why this life under the sun is meaningless. That's one of the reasons why. Because there may be good times, but bad times are ahead as we get older and it's hard. So don't waste your good years whining and complaining about how terrible you think life is. Enjoy these good times while you have them. And if you think these times that are actually good are bad, you got another thing coming. Well, he focuses now on the youth. And look in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 11. Rejoice, young man, in your childhood. And let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. And follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So remove grief and anger from your heart and put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. It almost sounds like we're reading Hemingway. This, I mean, this doesn't sound like the Bible. Would the Bible really tell us this? Absolutely. Some people say, might say, I don't, I don't need to tell my teenagers to relax. They, they know how to relax. They've got a PhD in relaxing. But we need to realize teens are stressed. Teens have many times a lot of relational problems, terrible family problems, and home life issues. And the ruthlessness that they experience at school is something that many of us maybe didn't experience when we were in school. It's hard to relate to, but many young people are attracted to the idea of suicide. And more and more young people are, are really falling into deep depression. God calls out to young people, I want you to enjoy the years that you are young. Now he's saying, I don't want you to be careless, but I do want you to be carefree. God is not calling young people to irresponsibility, but he is calling them to enjoy their youth while it lasts because it's not going to last very long. Don't get in such a hurry to grow up and, and get a job and buy a house and be out on your own. I try to tell Ty that, you know, he's 13 and he's ready. He's ready for a job. He's ready to move on. Say, so enjoy it while it lasts. You don't pay any rent. <laughs> You'll have plenty of opportunities later in life to pay bills. Trust me. Enjoy these short, short years while they last because it, it flies. And parents, we need to enjoy the years while our children are young. Don't try to rush those years along because they are precious years. Well, we really do need balance in this whole matter about enjoyment and about pleasure. So let's talk about that. We need to enjoy life the right way. What do I mean by that? Well, three things. Number one, we need to enjoy life with understanding. Realizing that enjoyment is not completely in our control. God is the one who blesses us with the ability to either enjoy our blessings or to not. Look in Ecclesiastes 6, 1 and 2. Chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God has not empowered him to eat from them, for a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. And so you see, it's not completely in our control whether we can enjoy the blessings of this life or not. 
Another part of understanding this, uh, this whole matter of pleasure is to realize that nothing on this earth can provide lasting fulfillment. Solomon experimented with every possible avenue in order to find out if there is meaning in this life under the sun. He experimented with wisdom. He experimented with pleasures beyond what any of us will probably ever get to experience. He experimented with possessions beyond our wildest dreams. And the irony is, here's a guy who could have anything. And he saw that it, ultimately it's meaningless. Think of it this way. So, sometimes we say, if I could only have blank, I'd be happy. If I could only have a million dollars, I'd be happy. Really? Are all millionaires happy? If I only had fame, I'd be happy. Really? Are all famous people happy? If I only had a wife, are all married people happy? If I only had children, are all people with children happy? The thing is, Solomon had all of his blanks filled. He was one person in history who had the ability to fill all of the blanks with any of his wildest dreams and imaginations. And he still came up empty-handed and saw that in those things is not ultimate fulfillment. So don't expect too much from these blessings of these pleasures that we enjoy under the sun because they, they will not provide lasting fulfillment. As one hymn says, and I think this would be a beautiful thought to express to God, I thank Thee too that all my joy is touched with pain, that shadows fall on brightest hours and thorns remain, so that earth's bliss may be my guide and not my chain. This earth is not the place to put our anchor. It's not the place for us to be chained to and to hold on too tightly to, as Brian talked about in one of his excellent articles this morning. Our citizenship is in heaven. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body into conformity with His glorious body, according to the working by which He has to subdue all things under Him. The anticipation of heaven shines down upon us in our earthly pilgrimage. So enjoy life with understanding. Secondly, enjoy life at the appropriate times. Let's look at chapter 3 and verse 4, which talks about here that there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. You know, there are inappropriate times to enjoy ourselves, like going fishing instead of going to church. It's inappropriate. There are great times to go fishing. Sunday mornings are not one of them. Or like partying before finals. Totally irresponsible. There are other times to party. Enjoying life the right way requires the self-control to balance responsibility with pleasure and the wisdom to match the appropriate emotion with the DNA of the moment. So enjoy life at the appropriate times. And thirdly, and I would say most importantly, enjoy life without sinful pleasures. In chapter 11 and verse 9 there, that passage where we were seeing where Solomon talks about young people enjoying this life, in the second half of that verse, it says, yet know that God will bring you into judgment for all these things. You know, we don't get a pass from God. Young people don't get a pass from God just because they're young. Numbers 32, 23 mentions at the end of that verse, and be sure your sin will find you out. While we need to avail ourselves of wholesome pleasures, we need to deprive ourselves of sinful pleasures and turn to God. We need to do what Moses did, who chose rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. 
But when we do the opposite of that and we embrace the passing pleasures of sin, those kinds of pleasures, we soon become a pretty sad spectacle. The young person who decides to turn his life to, to drugs and to alcohol, fast forward the clock 10 or 20 years, and that person looks like a shadow of his or her former self. It's scary. Or the young person who decides to give his life to sexual promiscuity. Fast forward the clock several years, and now there are children out of wedlock that belong to that individual. Maybe there's a divorce. Maybe there are multiple marriages and multiple divorces and multiple relationships, and their life is a train wreck. They thought they could sow their wild oats and miss the harvest. You don't get to skip the harvest. So don't sow the wild oats to begin with. Sow God's oats. Being a Christian doesn't take the fun out of life. It allows you to enjoy life without the painful consequences of sin. You see, God is offering to us a dimension of freedom in which we can find fulfillment within the framework of God's perimeters. That's the key. And that's why in 12.1 Solomon says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Now this, of course, can apply to all of us, whether we are young or not. Truth is, you'll never be as young as you are right now. And so enjoy life. But don't wait to make God your number one priority. That's what people do. Well, I, yeah, I want to do all that Christian stuff. I do want to do that. But first, I want to enjoy life a little bit. I want to kick up some dust. Well, the thing is, you can enjoy life and remember your Creator at the same time. That's exactly what Solomon is saying to do. And so, in conclusion, I want to encourage us all to realize that this life is not a dress rehearsal. We only get one shot at life. Each day that passes is a day you'll never get back. Each fleeting moment is here and then gone forever. Don't waste your precious moments and days living in negativity and misery. Embrace life. Celebrate it. Enjoy the simple pleasures that God has given you without guilt. There is nothing better for man in this vain life under the sun. However, this is not the conclusion of the matter. The conclusion of the matter, when all has been heard, is, is this, fear God and keep His commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until judgment day to remember your Creator. Remember Him now. Come to God today while you are still able. And you will find eternal pleasure. You will find everlasting feasting. And you will find true and ultimate fulfillment in the unapproachable sweet light of God's glorious presence in heaven. If you're not a Christian, you can become one today. If you need our prayers at this time, we invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing the song of invitation.